The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We can be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring a rose by any other name. Lord knows the scriptures of all cultures have been misinterpreted enough, so it's not my desire to add to the confusion. Yet, as a shamanic teacher with a degree in religious studies, I often find myself spontaneously quoting various religious texts as they apply to the subject at hand. All true religions throughout the ages have one goal in common, communion with the divine. This has been done by raising one's frequency through symbology, sacred geometry, and ritual. As an individual or group raises their frequency, they enter a realm where they can touch the hem of God's garment, so to speak, and contact their spirit guides, teachers, helping spirits, and or angels. These helpers are divination of the one God or spirit that moves through all things. So why do we need go-betweens? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, Revelation 1.8. God, or unity, is so massive and endless as to be incomprehensible by the human mind. Thus, the spirit that moves through all things shows itself to us in the form our minds can accept and work with in any given time and culture. Shamanically speaking, spirit guides, teachers, helping spirits, and angels are metaphors representing the frequency being presented to us at any given time to aid our evolution. This is by no means the entire enchilada. What is offered is based on our current frequency, willingness, and intent. The form the metaphor takes is based on the current culture's group symbology. I've been working shamanically over 40 years, and quite frankly, I've lost count of all my helpers, yet old ones will reappear to align me with the frequency needed for my clients as I work. They serve as a stairway of frequency, providing the bandwidth required to not only evolve myself, but to aid others in doing so. None is bigger, better, more powerful, or more holy than the next. They all have purpose, and they are all a part of God, as are we. My first teacher, a Lakota elder, was a devout Christian. One day I asked him how he reconciled his uh, spirit helpers with the one God teachings of Christianity. He told me, all are of one God, the trees, the rocks, the animals, and all things in the universe and beyond. My personal path to Wonkan Tonkin, he said, is Jesus Christ. Many scriptures also work with metaphors that evolve. This is to say, at one frequency, the metaphor may mean one thing, while at a higher frequency, the meaning evolves. Both meanings are truth, just a different aspect of the same. This is much like explaining the birds and the bees to a child. It's best never to lie, but important to only give them the truth they can process at their age. Yet, during these times of transition, we're witnessing misrepresentation of holy text being used to judge, condemn, brutalize, and murder non-believers. This manipulation victimizes both the zealots and their targets for political gains. These misguided actions are based on man-made dogma and group hysteria with no empathy or heart. Yet, God is love. If you desecrate another's God, you're desecrating your own, even if you don't think you have one. We're on a collision course with unity, and even the most staunch scientists will be hit in the face with what they seek. Truth, magic, 
God. Every magical practitioner or dabbler will be also hit in the face with scientific proof that separates the wheat from the chaff. The many faces of God over the ages has carried many names, but that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. William Shakespeare My guest this hour is Patrick Dunn, author of numerous wonderful books dedicated to communication with divine forces in order to achieve magical goals and ultimately enlightenment. After a short break, we'll introduce Patrick and explore his views on, among many other things, symbols, magic, and evolution. You are listening to The Science of Magic. Visit our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Patrick Dunn, author of numerous wonderful books that treat magic as an application of semiotics, the study of symbols. In his latest book, The Practical Art of Magic*, he lays out practices both ancient and modern that allow the magician to communicate with divine forces in order to achieve magical goals and ultimately enlightenment. Patrick is a poet, linguistic, pagan, and university English professor with a Ph.D. in modern literature and language. His understanding of symbiotics and the symbol of symbols arises from his training in linguistics and literary theory. He's practiced magic since childhood. His website, pomomagic.wordpress.com. That would be P-O-M-O-M-A-G-I-C dot wordpress dot com. Patrick. I've really been looking forward to bringing your considerable knowledge to our listeners. Thank you so much for joining us on The Science of Magic. Well, thank you for having me. (laughs) Hey, to dive right in, what is theology and how does it relate to the many names of the divine? Uh, Well, thergy is, I mean, the meaning of thergy is kind of hidden in the name itself. It comes from two Greek roots, uh, theos meaning God and urgon meaning work. So you put them together, you get thergy. Theurgia, which means work with gods. And in the ancient world, um, they divided magic into two broad categories, thergy, which was god work, and thaumaturgy, which was miracle making. Um, so thergy is sort of like the, um, the, the, the end you plug into the wall to get the thaumaturgy to work. It's the, the accessing of divine forces in order to power magic. Um, which sounds very practical and kind of mercenary, I suppose, to to us. But uh, the Greeks simply saw that as part. The ancient Greeks simply saw that as part of their religion. Was that this this was a thing that could um, that the gods could be used as sources of power? 
Well, that's kind of like shamanism in that, that we, uh, when we align with our helping spirits, which of course is, as I said before, is in alignment with the divine ultimately, it powers what we're trying to do in the world. And as long as we're trying to do things in the world that agree with the way life works and the way God's law would be, then um, it works well for us. And if, if we're working against it, trying to misuse that power, it tends to have a, have a nasty backlash. Are we talking about the same thing here? I think so. I think at least a very similar thing. Uh, certainly you don't want to uh, anger a uh, God. <laughs> Although, you know, on one level, the highest level, a God can't be angry because gods are perfect and therefore perfectly happy. But um, we can make ourselves such that we can no longer access the God. We can turn ourselves away from it, and that feels like the God is angry. That's a really nice way of putting it, because that, that's what I've seen. God doesn't get angry. But right. by misusing the powers that be, we have desecrated ourselves to the point we can't reconnect. Right. Gotcha. And that was, so, of course, redemption's possible, right? It is possible to come back from that, but... Well, we all do it on a daily basis, basis inadvertently. <laughs> it's a matter of <laughs> coming back once you know better is a little tougher, huh? Yeah. yeah. What's your definition of magic, Patrick? Um, well, um, that's actually a tricky one. I, I, you know, uh, Aleister Crowley's definition of magic was the art and science of causing change and conformity to the will. Um, I think that's sometimes misunderstood because when he wrote, art and science both had slightly different meanings than they do now, potentially. So art not only meant what we mean by it now, you know, making pretty things, but also meant a, a technique, a, a practice was an art. Um, and science meant also what we mean by it now, you know, this formalized body of knowledge we call science, arising from the scientific method. But it also meant uh, any sort of, of system of knowledge, any way of knowing, any epistemology. So uh, for me, I mean, keeping that in mind, magic is a set of techniques and also a, a way of knowing that is different from science, even though it shares some similarities, and it's different from religion as well but it shares some similarities with both of those as a way of knowing. And I think it's a way of knowing that our culture has largely um, ignored. Um, we've, we've casted all the superstition and sort of thrown it in the dustbin, which means there's a whole way of knowing the world that many people simply don't have access to. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, it absolutely is a shame. Um, so in, in keeping with the name of the show, what do you think the relationship is between science and magic? complicated in a word. Um, I, I, sometimes <laughs> I, I've been wrestling with this for years, actually. Uh, sometimes people say things like magic is just um, science that hasn't been discovered yet. I used to say that. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that that's devaluing magic to a certain degree. Um, science is great at answering certain kinds of questions about the physical world, about the laws that govern it. Magic is less good at answering those kinds of questions, but it can answer other kinds of questions like how do we construct a meaning? How do we make a life that, that we want to have that's worth having? You know, how do we live in the practical sense a good life? Um, and so there it's almost like a form of applied philosophy, philosophy applied to physics. And there just isn't room for that quite in the scientific method as we currently understand it. And uh, in my first book, I, I actually say that uh, I don't think that science could ever prove magic. I don't think science could even investigate magic. I've, I've come back from that a little bit, and I think maybe there are some applications of the scientific method that could be productive when applied to magic. There's some statistical methods and so forth that I think could show some patterns um, in, in the way magic works if we applied them properly. Uh, but I don't think it could prove that magic works. I think you're you're always going to end up with the the possibility that that magic is coincidence because it's always going to look like it's consistent with the narrative of the world. It's not going to coins are not going to rain out of the sky. Um, I wish I wish I could do that, <laughs> but uh, I I've never seen that. Uh, the weirdest thing I think I've ever seen that that could break a physical law is I think once I may have seen telekinesis, but there's lots of possibilities that I, that I was deceived. So um, I, I, I suspect that the, the relationship between science and magic is two ways of knowing that share some similarities, but ultimately are separate. 
So one deals with one realm and one deals with another. And uh, at this point, hardly the two ever meet in the middle. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. When, when scientists try to make meaning out of the world, they usually, frankly, make a hash of it because <laughs> it, it, that's, not, that's not what science is for. <laughs> um, but I, in, incredibly intelligent scientists who have made tremendous contributions to the way we understand uh, the physical universe will occasionally say things and be reported in the press as making statements and, and having opinions about things that aren't scientific, that are really quite naive. And uh, that always strikes me as strange. Like there's this person so much smarter than I am in this realm who nevertheless says profoundly naive things about the way we should live our lives. Uh, And also I don't think, I think mad magicians do the same thing. I've I've been at more than a few gatherings where I've had to sort of bite my tongue a little bit because people will make claims about the physical universe using magic. And I think that's the metaphoric nature of the models we use in magic. Gotcha. So, so how how do you see magic as opposed to what's referred to as miracles? Ah, well, uh, again, complicated in a word. Um, <laughs> I, I think religion is another way of knowing that shows some similarities to magic, but operates on somewhat different principles. So. Uh, the miracles that come out of religion come through faith and belief. And I don't think faith and belief are the primary drivers of magic. I think uh, resonance with the symbols that we use, an aesthetic sort of, um, uh, oh, what's what's the word? Entrainment, maybe, right? That, that symbols, something in the symbol resonates in us, whether we believe in it or not. So... I think a magician can work, for example, with, I don't know, Hecate, right, without believing that Hecate exists, that, you know, that there's a goddess wandering through the woods guarding doorways, um, uh, but can still resonate with that symbol. Well, in religion, to to get a miracle, at least in, you know, most religions that that are current, you you kind of have to have some faith in, in the gods. One of the things that's really interesting in uh, some of the ancient curse texts, um, we have a whole pile of tablets that people wrote cursing people, unfortunately. But what's interesting about it is how little belief seems to come into it. You'll have calling upon these divine forces, and so people will call upon Hecate, and then Jesus, and then Moses, all in the same, same text, as if, they're just sort of reaching out to these symbols without necessarily, you know, if, if you believe in Jesus, um, it's a little hard to also call on Hecate. <laughs> I mean, I guess people, people could do it. Diametrically do. opposed there, you say? <laughs> a, a little bit, perhaps, right? So, although, then again, they're both savior figures. So, right. so now, you see, now I'm thinking magically, right? They're both savior figures. They both ha- have that resonance of being a soter, a savior. So there... That works, but as a faith, you know, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and returned from the dead three days later, um, Hecate becomes somewhat more irrelevant, I would think. I don't know, I'm not a Christian, so it's hard for me to say what a Christian might think, but that's what I imagine. <laughs> yeah. So so as I'm hearing you, um, it's like magic uses uh, sacred geometry and alignment and frequency to achieve what it does, and... Um, Miracles use faith and group intent to create an outcome by resonance. Would that kind of sum it up? That seems to sum it up, yes. So the the, the important bit about the miracle is actual deep-down faith in the God. I think you can practice a spell perfectly well without believing it will work and still have results. I know other people disagree with me there, but they're wrong, so... Well, sorcery speaking, absolutely that's true. So we have to be very careful of our intent and our words because we can unconsciously, in my, in my viewpoint, cast a spell on someone else without ever meaning to do harm. You know, this is really exciting. Uh, we're, we will have to take a short break. Uh, we'll return to our discussion after this short break. You are listening to The Science of Magic. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. You want to hear more? Previous broadcasts of any of the episodes can always be found on our website www.thescienceofmagic.net
The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. Visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Patrick Dunn, author of The Practical Art of Divine Magic. His website is pomagic.wordpress.com. We were just talking about... um, uh, magic and um, sorcery and spells and curses and all that fun sort of stuff. Um, and it, to me, there's a fine line between shamanism, what I call sorcery, and I teach my students five basic laws to keep it clean, if you will. Uh, never work without permission. Don't take energy away from where it belongs. Don't impose energy where it does not belong. And work only within the laws of nature. And number five, of course, is do no harm. While sorcery uses many shamanic principles and rituals, it usually violates at least one, if not five, of these laws. So, Patrick, what recommendations do you have for our listeners on how to be sure they're keeping magic clean? Well, that's that's an interesting question. I think uh, the the ethical element of magic that that's a that's a thing that's sort of been emphasized in the 20th century, right? The the Wicca movement, for example, centralizes ethics, right? Do do as thou wilt. Um, but do no harm, right? Um, that wasn't always the case, at least from the archaeological evidence, that, that magic was often used for very bad things. Uh, I was talking earlier about the curse tablets. Um, it's just interesting to see the things that they were aimed toward, right? Cursing the other side of a race so they'll lose, so you can make some money, that sort of thing. Stuff that would just be beyond the pale now, of course. Obviously, but that's not what we would want to do. But I think every magician has to to think about their ethics for themselves to some degree and, and decide, okay, what is, where is my line? And I, I'm going to stand firm on that line, no matter how tempted I become. Um, my personal rule is I would never cast a spell that I wouldn't do the equivalent physical action for. So I wouldn't, I would not punch someone in the face. So I'm not going to do a spell to hurt someone. Right. Um, right. Exactly. Uh, Along with thergy, thergy does kind of bundle in an ethical element. The, the virtues themselves, they're considered a kind of purification. The better a person you are, the easier it is to commune with the gods. And so uh, developing virtues, developing personal traits like honesty, courage, wisdom, justice, generosity, um, uh, yeah, self-control, those help us connect with the gods because those of course in their most perfect manifestation those are the traits the gods all exhibit you know no one's more generous than than helios the god of the sun (laughs) he shines on everyone so uh so that kind of bundles an ethics with thergy that isn't necessarily there with thaumaturgy at least in the ancient world Uh, i think yeah so, you know, there's a lot of talk about black magic and white magic in our modern day. So is this what we're talking about here? Uh, and would you mind addressing the differences as you see it? Well, I think, again, I think that's a very modern distinction. I think that's a distinction that probably only goes back a couple hundred years. Right. Um, but I do think, I mean, a lot of the spells that we have, we know were, were illegal. Um, in, in Rome, in the Roman Empire, it was illegal to practice the kind of magic that people regularly practiced, cursing people. Um, and so the fact that we have find so many of these cursed tablets, some of that's probably just a function of the fact they're made of lead so they don't decay. Right? There might have been <laughs> other spells done in less 
less permanent material that, that are nicer, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what I always hope. You know, you hate to think that these, these people who founded Western civilization were awful, but some of them were probably awful. But, um, but we know that those were illegal, right, in the Roman Empire, and yet people still did them. So I, I think there was probably less of a firm line between black and white magic in the ancient world. I think it's a helpful distinction for us to have, though, because we don't live in the ancient world. Um, you know, exactly, we don't. And things, okay. you know, cause and effect are so, so much more um, instantaneous right now, it seems like, that we have to be pretty mindful. Yes, very much so. I'm mindful, I think, is the exact right word for it. We have to be mindful of what we're doing, not just go off half-cocked, as it were. And right. I think some of the disciplines that come with thergy help us develop that kind of mindfulness. And, and it is a matter of becoming more conscious and evolving, and evolving is using um, our, our magic or whatever form that we use to commune with the divine in the ways that cooperate with nature rather than manipulate and, and work against the laws, and that would be keeping it clean. You know, so would you mind speaking to magic as an abli- application of semiotics, sacred geometry, and linguistics? I, I just want to keep you on your toes here, Patrick. <laughs> I like being on my toes, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> semiotics, of course, is the, is the formal study of symbols, how, how symbols work, how we can look at a symbol and know what it means, where, where, how do we get from the symbol to its meaning. And you would think that would be kind of an obvious thing. Well, we, we learned it somewhere. But it's actually much more complex than that. And uh, there's, there's a lot of fuzzy area in semiotics and understanding how how symbols mean, how we know what a word means, for example, is, is a somewhat an open debate. There's several competing theories. They don't, they, don't, they don't fit together. We don't have a unified theory of how meaning works, which I think is amazing. Um, so uh, when it comes to magic, what we're dealing with, of course, largely, maybe even entirely, are symbols. Uh, even people who do energy work, of course, are using the energy as a symbol. You know, if, if, if it wasn't a symbol, if it was energy in the physical sense, they'd, they'd have a lower electric bill, I suspect, <laughs> uh, power their house with it. But um, that, that, that doesn't work that way, and we all know it doesn't work that way, because it's, it's a symbol. It's saying, okay, there's these sensations that I associate with energy, there's these visualizations that I associate with energy, and they accomplish these things the way that energy, similar to the way that energy accomplishes things in the physical world. Um, so one of the things I'm... I, I'm continually trying to get at and trying to understand is how those symbols work. And one of the things that's actually sort of my cutting edge right now is experimenting with symbols that deliberately don't have meaning and seeing if meaning, like if they attract meaning, if meaning attaches to them. So I'll do a ritual that is essentially randomly designed, just random, random actions that have no real connection to any you know, symbol system, existing symbol system, but with a clear intent. And what I'm finding is it works just about as well as getting out the tables of correspondence and doing, you know, the old-fashioned Kabbalistic spells work. So Isn't that fun? I, because it's like everything is about intent, it seems like. So if you have clean intent, you can use anything you need to to make that happen, really, if your intent is strong and clear enough. And if you have ill intent, the same thing can happen. Are you seeing it that way? I am, except I'd also add that intent not only has to be clear, it has to be unified, and we often don't have a unified intent. When we want because we're not unified with ourselves, is that what you mean? Right. You know, part of me wants this thing, part of me doesn't want this thing, and the two fight against each other. And then in magic, I think it amplifies that fight, and you end up with nothing, of course, because... Or a mess. You have two... <laughs> or a mess. Oh, yeah, sometimes you do end up with a mess. I have ended up with a few messes, but let's not go into those. <laughs> so our, our effectiveness as magicians or magic workers, it totally depends on our pr- level of processing and evolution. Is that what you're saying? I... I in, in, yes, yes, and, and and the clarity, the clarity of the channel. You know, when we communicate a, a symbol through a channel, the channel has noise, and it can interfere with the symbol. Um, and most of us are going through life muttering to ourselves in a crowded coffee shop. When when you want to do magic, you need to stand up in a in a quiet place and speak clearly, right? Um, not literally. Well, sometimes literally. But metaphorically, that's what it is to do magic: is to speak back to the universe in a language it can't ignore. And um, 
to do that, you need a quiet place, and your mind is the place that's is the is the noisy coffee shop that keeps interfering with our our messages. So I think meditation is an extremely important part of magical practice uh, to help learn to control the quiet or the noise in our minds and clear that channel. So to to clear the channel, um, and when we want to speak to the divine or you know work magic, we have to go to where it's at. That's a job that we have to do in order to connect. Is that what you're seeing? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to put it, to go to where it's at. And, and, and that, of course, you know, isn't necessarily literal going anywhere, but, but inside of us is where it's at. You have to find that place where, where, where the gods dwell inside of you in order to, to communicate. Right. So our, the, where they dwell inside of us is our channel to the divine, but we have to weed our way through our own stuff to get there. <laughs> That's right. What, what, a, what a journey, huh? What a journey. Well, that's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to have to take another break, Patrick. Um, we'll be back on the flip side of this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic, a place where magic and our, our altruistic professional of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. Our website is www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Patrick Dunn, author of The Practical Art of Divine Magic. His website, p-o-m-o-m-a-g-i-c dot wordpress dot com. Welcome back, Patrick. Thank you. We've been having a lot of fun here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I have been. I don't know if you're suffering too or not. <laughs> um, so what do you see as a practical application of divine magic? Uh, wow, that's an excellent question. Um, I think the, 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 we often think that these sorts of things are very you know, airy-fairy and don't, don't come down to our day-to-day life. But in my experience, this, this sort of practice it just improves life in general. It not only improves life in terms of you now I can get the things I want, right, which is one of the things magic gets us, but also now I know what I want, and I don't want necessarily as much. I don't want the things I don't need anymore. And uh, I'm content with life, and I know where I need to improve myself, and I'm content with that. You know, I'm content with my own imperfections, which are many. And um, at the same time, I'm willing to continue to work on them, and I think that's that sort of contentment and peace is one of the things that that thurgy and similar practices can give us uh, that that's of tremendous practical value. It makes life easier to live, and life is not easy to live, <laughs> you know, on the face of it. So, I think that's where it comes from. That's where the the value comes in. 
Yeah, you know, peace is a rare commodity and much needed in this world. And if we could be at a peace with ourselves and with our environment, that's worth a million to me. You know, before we get too far into this last segment, Patrick, you have some wonderful books out there. Where can people find them? Well, they're available on Amazon, of course. Um, they're also available, uh, you can order them from uh, Barnes & Noble. Um, uh, once in a while, they actually carry a copy. Every time I go into Barnes & Noble, I check, and sometimes they have copies of some of them, but you can order them there as well. Uh, most bookstores can carry them, so they're, they're published by Llewellyn, so they're, they're easy to come by. Um, yeah, Amazon is probably the easiest place to, to get a hold of them. Yeah, it's taken over the world, hasn't it? <laughs> it has. It has indeed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, would you mind sharing a personal story of magic at work with our listeners? Absolutely. I, I, well, actually, I, w- I wouldn't mind, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, probably my um, biggest success was, uh, it's going to sound corny right, and cute, but uh, I found love through magic. I... Um, I, it was a, a, a lunar eclipse, which lunar eclipses are very dangerous times to do magic, but I was like, I need all the oomph I can get, and you get a lot during a lunar eclipse. So I performed a ritual to call upon a spirit, a daimon, a, a, a good spirit, a messenger spirit of the gods, to uh, bring me a um, um, socium congruum, a, uh, a, a suitable companion. Hmm. And... Uh, the very next month, the next next full moon, um, I met someone the very day of the next full moon, and we have been together for nine years. And, wow! Uh, yeah, he says he says I magicked him into existence. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing. Now you can have a bunch of callers looking for how did you do that, right? <laughs> 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 so, uh, what do you, how do you, you know, you refer to divine magic. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the, the divine magic is magic that has to do with and connects with these, these ideas of the divine throughout, throughout history. Um, the gods, basically. Uh, and, you know, in, in my book, I focus mostly on the Egyptian and Greek and Roman gods, because those are the ones that were... Uh, in late antiquity, sort of uh, the, the main pantheons that people um, used in, in thergy. But of course, it could work with any any set of gods uh, that that one feels drawn to. Um, I, you, there, there could be a thergy of, for example, you know, Norse magic, sort of a satru thergy. Uh, so th- those divine forces, from from the thergic perspective exist sort of in a world of, of perfect ideas, right? This platonic world that we're a reflection of or a shadow of. And it's a way to get back to that platonic world and see sort of what's at the root of reality, what's, what's casting all these shadows that, that we think of as reality. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're a bridge, and they, they, they exist for that purpose, as a, as a bridge between divine ideal reality and this physical one. So the physical reality being made of our group agreement <laughs> and limited mm-hmm. by okay. our group belief systems, in my opinion, versus reconnecting with the divine and clarifying what's real and what's not as is in alignment with the design. Is that it? Exactly. What's really real is is what the gods, the, they're the intermediaries between what's really real and what we think is real. Um and, you know, it's impossible to describe the really real. You get glimpses of it, but you, they can't be cast into, some, into words. They can't be directly symbolized, which makes it hard to explain what it really is. It yes, it's kind of like a moving target, isn't it? Cave wall. Yeah. In talking with you, I see you have a natural gift in the magical realm, to, to say the least. So can just, anyone pra- pa- excuse me. can just anyone practice magic? And if so, what does it take? I, I suspect that anyone can. Um, I think what it takes is introspection, the ability to look inside yourself and know yourself, um, and imagination. That's necessary. You have to be able to to imagine things being other than they are if you expect them to change, right? If you expect the world to change, <laughs> you that, yeah. imagine what it would be like. And um, those two skills, particularly, are are particularly important. Um, and there's a certain amount of discipline. There's there's a necessity to be able to sit down and very 
uh, I don't want to say grimly, but very firmly take yourself in hand and say, okay, this is not working for me. This, this, this part of my life is not working. Why isn't it working? What, where, where is my intent messed up here and what can I change about it? Or to say, well, yeah, this part of my life isn't working and maybe this is unfixable. Maybe this is something I have to learn to live with and how can I do that? Perfect. So how can what you offer in your books help with spiritual evolution, Patrick? Um, I, I think the the practice of thirgy is sort of a um, very old, right? It's very ancient and mm-hmm. uh, very time-tested method of of spiritual evolution. The eventual goal is henosis, which comes from the Greek word for one, hang. Um, it's it's becoming one again with the the ultimate reality, and. Uh, I think one of the advantages of it is it doesn't require you to withdraw from the world. It requires you to engage with the world, which I think is much more suitable to the way we live now and the way they lived in you know, late antiquity uh, than climbing up a mountaintop and becoming a hermit. I don't think any of us have the desire, well, maybe some of us probably do, but most of us don't have the desire or the capacity to become a hermit. We have jobs. <laughs> some of us love our jobs. <laughs> you know? So we don't want to give them up. Uh, exactly. And this helps make a spiritual life out of, out of an ordinary life. Got it. Okay, so what do you see as communion with divine forces, and how can a person be sure it is indeed the divine they're in contact with? Now, that's an excellent question. Uh, a, a healthy dose of skepticism. I'll add that to the list of things that, that are useful in studying magic. Um, and, you know, there's not an easy, quick answer I can give to that, but I would say that if the peace that comes from this is sort of a spaced out, not paying attention to the world, kind of staring off with a you know little stone smile on your face, that's probably not a divine force. Um, Got it. it Got it's it. an engaged peace with the world as it is, not with fantasy worlds. You know, and if, you, if you're drinking special Kool Aid, you've probably gone astray in terms of. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. You know, divine. I have so enjoyed having you on this show, Patrick. Unfortunately. Time flies, and we're totally out of it. So I'm going to have to say goodbye. Thank you again for being on The Science of Magic. People, remember, you can always find us on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net, where you can connect with us on our social media, join our mailing list, or listen to past episodes. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love, and don't forget to smell the roses. One nation.